And we are live with another episode of What the Flock podcast. I'm Heather from Tog Hollow Farm and Aviary. And I'm Sean from Birds by Us. <clears throat> and we have a very special guest with us today, uh, Tony Silva. And uh, let's hop right in. Uh, and Tony, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been doing this? Sure. So uh, first of all, I, I apologize. I am in my work clothes. I um, I work for a petroleum company, but the birds are my life, and I come home and I start working at it. I have been a naval culturist about 45, 46 years. My father, my grandmother, and my great grandmother kept birds. They kept canaries, pigeons, and parrots. So I always say it's sort of in my blood. Um, I have been uh, a naval culturist, like I said, for about 45 years. And uh, during that time, I've studied most parrot species in the wild, and I've been very fortunate uh, to have bred most species. Um, and I can say fortunate because when I got into this, imports were still common. People were importing massive amounts of birds, so we were we were exposed to lots of species that have since disappeared that we were able to breed. Unfortunately, we lacked the foresight to say, let's establish them. Everybody bred birds and sold them for pets. No one kept the young back for future breeders. And that's why we're sort of seeing today a, a shrinking uh, availability of African greys. Everybody bred from the wild imports. Nobody kept babies back. Um, and you know, many of these birds that were imprinted aren't breeding real well. So yeah. uh, I was very. Right. And um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's very devastating. We see that a lot with a lot of species nowadays, like a lot, everything's going to the wayside. There's a lot of birds that I love and I, you know, you can't even keep because like they're, they're not around. And that just really So stinks. when I, when I was working on siticulture, uh, not that it was information that I contained in there, but I wanted to see how many species we've lost. So at the heyday of uh, the bird trade, which would have been the 1990s, we had about 288 out of about 350 parrot species available in the U.S. Wow. wow. Today, and that we were breeding, we were breeding all of those species. And what I said by, by we, I'm referring to wave of in the U.S. Today, we're down to about 37 species with viable populations. And viable populations are those that will be able to survive the next 50 years. We've wow. lost species that range from Tucum and Amazons and coral-billed parrots to uh, fig parrots. The species loss has been massive, massive. And yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. Yeah, it's yeah. really a shame, honestly. And um, so um, we'll just get into the, the main topic, topic of this of podcast. This <clears throat> We're going to be talking about diets specifically. And um, our first question, uh, I'm going to give it over to Sean. He'll, he'll ask you here. So, Tony, uh, our, our first question was, what type of diet do you feed your birds? Is it the same diet for all of them? Do, do all of your species of birds, they range in their diets? So. so let me take you back to the 1970s. At that time, mortality in wild parrots was massive. Um, and most of the mortality was dietary related. The standard was parrot mix. It was sunflower seeds, peanuts, uh, kibble a few other seeds. If they were lucky, they got oranges and apples, sometimes bananas. A number of veterinarians, particularly Ted Lefevre, started to promote the use of pellets. And the idea was that you could contain vitamins and minerals that the birds couldn't get in their normal fare to improve their health and to overcome many of the dietary related diseases that they were seeing in the clinics. Initially, I was sort of hesitant to use pellets. Uh, I had seen most parrot species in the wild. I knew the variety that they consumed, uh, but I started to sort of stick my toe in the water with pellets. And I realized that 
the birds really improved. Their quality uh, improved, reproduction uh, was better. We were seeing less diseases, pox, for example, which was very common, was less less frequent. We saw respiratory diseases, respiratory diseases were, were fewer, and overall health and mortality, health improved, mortality reduced. So I started looking at pellets as a means of providing the birds with a lot of the nutrients that they needed. And I became quickly convinced that pellets were the way to go, but they weren't the sole diet. You had to modify the pellets. You had to provide vegetables. And I don't provide fruits and I don't feed fruits because when we look at wild parrots, they consume fruits green. They don't eat them ripe. And they don't eat them ripe because they don't want to compete with toucans and fruit bats and every other bird and mammal that eats fruits. So they eat them green. They eat them green. They're exposed to toxins because plants produce toxins so that their seeds don't get eaten green. The parrots sort of compensate for these toxins by eating bark and clay and many elements. Uh, I've seen uh, parrots in Paramo, which is cloud forest, eat lichens to bind the toxic alkaloids in the foods so that they could excrete them. Lowland parrots will eat bark. Uh, there's a huge population of ringneck parakeets in Seville, Spain. They eat uh, horse chestnuts and green olives that are toxic. And then they immediately eat clay, uh, the clay soil, or they eat bark. It binds with the toxins, they excrete it, and they can survive. So I avoided feeding fruits because, one, it wasn't part of their natural diet, certainly not ripe. Um, and secondly, because when we were feeding cultivated apples and bananas, and pears and all of these fruits, uh, we were seeing lots of yeast in these birds. So over time, I I evolved a diet that focused on, say, 70% pellets, 30% vegetables, and I like using carrots and American sweet potato and pumpkin and squash, and we steam those to break the fibers so that the birds can access the beta carotene, the vitamin A in these elements, which they need. Parrots have a high need for vitamin A. And then I also gave hot peppers and greens and many other things. The diet is strictly vegetable and pellet based. Macaws get nuts. All the birds get a tiny piece of Dave's killer bread. It's an organic bread that is 21 grains. We we put a little dab of peanut butter or walnut butter or almond butter. And I walk around and I give each of my birds these treats. And the reason for that is I want the bird to interact with me early in the morning. If that bird doesn't interact with me in the morning, I come back and I look at it because maybe it's not well. Maybe it's getting harassed by the mate. Maybe it chilled overnight, whatever. So that little treat uh, allows me to interact with my birds they really look forward to it and it's it gives them something special i don't grind up the vegetables i don't believe in this chop it becomes a, a, a mush wild parrots evolves with with psychopedactyl feet so that they can do this they can grab things they don't eat mush in the wild they actually will grab a fruit uh, or a pod or a seed and hold it and eat it and when they drop some of these seeds, they contribute to the health of the forest. We know that parrots take whole foods. They often drop it. Where they drop it, the green seeds often germinate, and they contribute to the creation of forest. Where parrots have been trapped out, the forest begins to decline. We know that blue-throated macaws uh, create these palm tree islands by actually dropping seeds that, that they harvest whole to eat. They, they, they drop them by accident and then a palm tree sprouts and that gives way to another forested island. So I give birds vegetables, 
pellets, treats, macaws, African greys get nuts, uh, palm cockatoos get nuts, um, the rest of the birds get little treats, and overall they do very well. We do give a lot of enrichment, and the enrichment that I give includes some of the natural foods that they would encounter. They get palm seeds, they get pods, they get flowers, they get uh, branches that they eat the bark. So we provide the birds with mental well-being, with the enrichment. We give them food that they encounter in the wild. And then we also um, give them what is healthy. I have birds in my collection that go back to the 1970s that are still very active and healthy. Oh. So if we give them a good diet, uh, they'll do well. There is this recent trend in aviculture where people want to feed chop and natural foods, and they don't simply understand that while it may be a good selling point, we need to give the birds some fat and some minerals and many other elements that they wouldn't get in a chop. So if you want to give chop, it's fine. I encourage giving bigger pieces of food so they can hold it. That's why that foot evolved. Um, I would recommend that uh, if you do give chop, give them something else. They'll need uh, some protein, some fat. They'll need <laughs> Many of these parrots eat animals in the wild. Uh, I've seen macaws take small birds and snails. I've seen kia uh, eat uh, sheep. I've seen kakarikis feed on dead penguins that were washed ashore. Wow. And I can go on and on and on. Um, um, we get guava here that gets infested with these little uh, fly maggots and Brodogerus parakeets, canary wings and white wings, go absolutely crazy when they get a guava that's infested with these little uh, worms. And they'll, they'll tear it apart looking for the worm because this is what they do in the wild. They do feed on some animal protein. I don't recommend feeding um, you know, beef, for example, but a piece of chicken is, is okay. Uh, I give my African grays tuna fish, um, but I do that because they need the protein to breed. So if it's a pet bird, we can give it protein in the form of, say, almonds. I don't like peanuts because of the risk of aflatoxins. Um, right, and um, I actually do have another question that leads off of the pellets. Like, I feed pellets in my aviary, Sean feeds pellets in his aviary, but um. There's a lot of people that are not on board with pellets, you know what I mean? And and you've been in this a long time. What are the problems you're seeing with birds that are not getting like a pelleted diet at all where they're just getting a fully seed diet or like a like a just chop diet? Are they having issues when they're not getting these pellets? So, you know, I I have a problem with these people that pro, the, these proponents of this chop diet and you know, I always ask them how many species have you bred? I've bred 82% of all parrot species. And oftentimes when you put them on the spot, they can't answer it. They haven't bred anything. And if the birds don't reproduce, that tells you that is a huge, huge flag saying, hey, there's a problem here. I understand right. if you have a pet bird, you don't want to reproduce it, but you want to keep it healthy. You know, I see birds all the time that come to me with brittle nails, with poor feathering. And when you look at the diet, it's often these chopped diets and nothing else. They expect the bird to feed on a, on a, on a, a chopped up, mushed up vegetable diet. And people will say, well, pellets are not natural. They're, they're not found in parrot habitat. <clears throat> Alfalfa is not part of a natural parrot diet. Apples are not part of a natural parrot diet. Very few things that we actually feed are part of their natural diet. Sunflower right. seeds are not part of their natural diet. They are a crop that's introduced into their area and the birds will eat it. 
But then so they so will they eat corn and wheat and these things that are found in pellets. So if you tell me I won't feed pellets because it's my purpose, personal choice, I understand that. But don't tell me that it's not natural, that uh, corn is not naturally found in part of the diet. If you go to the Vatican or if you go to the Archive of Indies in Seville, where records from the early discoverers are maintained, you will be able to read that parrots in Mexico were eating corn. Corn was grown by the time Columbus discovered the New World. They are a crop that is widely grown in Mexico. There are plenty of sculptures and statutes in documents showing that these wild parrots were raiding corn crops. Uh, they weren't raiding alfalfa crops, you know? So we need to be realistic. Nothing that we really feed them is, or very little is natural. We just need to feed them something that is nutritious, nutritious and that will meet their needs and keep them healthy. And by healthy, the bird should be able to reproduce if that's your wish, or it should be able to, re to maintain colors. I recently saw a blue crowned conure. And blue crowned conures, when the breeding season comes, whether they are reproductively active or not, get orange legs. Their legs turn orange. This bird's legs were gray. That, that told me there's something wrong there because it's not a natural color for that time of year. And I took the person, I showed him my birds, and they said, well, they're breeding. I said, well, let me show you some birds that are not breeding, that are actually, I have a couple of blue crowns that are pets. And they were totally shocked. So they went home and they changed the diet and slowly the bird's legs have started to turn orangish. We look at pionis, the orbital ring, the ring around the eye should become pink. Um, these things tell us the best lesson that I ever had. I was a naive 18 year old and I went to see a bird breeder by the name of Ramon Nogel in Florida. And uh, Ramon was, was a bit out there. He was a Kardecian spiritualist priest. You know, he spoke to spirits, the spirits went through him as a medium, and then he talked to his delegation. I'm very open-minded. That was a bit bizarre for an 18-year-old. And he said, you know what? If you listen to your birds, they will talk to you. And I thought, I don't know what he's smoking, but it can't <laughs> be good. I came home, and, and, you know, my grandfather was a highly educated man. My grandmother was, was, was a doctor. And he said, maybe you're interpreting what he said way too literally. Maybe what he's telling you is, is that they use uh, subtle signs. And today I will tell you, that there is no doubt that the birds communicate with us and they don't use words. Uh, they can, you know, if the bird talks, they, they can clearly, we have a military macaw here that one day the watering system failed and uh, my workers are Hispanic, and the birds started to scream, agua, agua, <laughs> letting them know that water, a word that they heard, because people would say, hey, turn on the agua, shut off the agua. The bird communicated using words. Oftentimes, wow. they communicate with body language, with um, actions, with their appearance, with many other things. I'll give you a classic example. I have a pair of scarlet macaws. I bred both of them. And the female would always never go into the, she never went into the nest box, ever, ever, ever. I offered every nest box imaginable, never looked at it. She would spend a lot of time on the corner. And one day she grabbed a palm seed, you know, a good sized palm seed, like a small egg, and she took it to the corner of the cage and she started to incubate this palm seed. She was telling me, I want my nest in this spot. I went to the chicken coop, I took out a chicken nest, I sterilized it, I put it in there, 
And within three weeks, she was incubating eggs in that chicken box. She what? was communicating yeah. with me. She was letting me know. So when you see a palm cockatoo whose cheeks are pink or white, that bird's not healthy. They should be bright red. Uh, when you see many of these things, the birds are communicating with you. And you know, hey, something's wrong. Pay attention. You know, and unfortunately, in this day of the Internet, everybody is an expert. Everybody um, knows more than anybody, even though they may have their experience may be limited to one parakeet or one budgie. And unfortunately, many of these birds end up paying the price. I have several cockatoos here and we do accept um, birds that are unwanted. We don't braid them. We, we, we integrate them into a flock so they do well. I have more than one cockatoo where the owner decided to go on the Internet because the bird was starting to get agitated and somebody said, oh, give it a cardboard box. And they did. And when the cardboard box got dirty, the lady reached into the cage and got attacked. 54 stitches later, the bird wow. was brought to a vet to be euthanized. It was not the bird's fault. She stimulated that bird into breeding. By stimulating it into breeding, she created a problem. And the problem reached its peak when she gave it a nest. Part of the issue that I have with these wet, you know, mush diets is we're encouraging these birds to become sexually active at certain times of the year. We want to give them as bland a diet, as dry as possible when they, when we're dealing with birds that are aggressive, that can become very hormonally charged. You don't want to give chop to a umbrella cockatoo male that is starting to show signs of wanting to braid screaming, uh, agitation, looking to hide under the sofa or the couch, the nest. Because if you do, you are encouraging. That bird is looking for wet food because that is part of what stimulates it. It rains in the wild. When it rains, plants accumulate more water in their seed pods, in their seeds, in their fruit which the birds will eat green. So the bird's moisture content has gone up. It right. thinks, hey, it's breeding season. We want to discourage, we want to give those birds when they're reproductively, um, when they're aggressive, we want to give them as bland of a diet as possible. And some, some species, cockatoos and, and, and cockatiels, for example, will reproduce on pretty poor diets. So, you know, rose-breasted cockatoos have evolved to eat grass seeds in the wild. They're very low fat, very low protein. And when do they nest? When there's rains and the seeds begin to sprout. So we want to watch the diet. We obviously want to give our birds the healthiest diet so we don't they don't get sick, but we also have to watch what we're feeding them because we may be stimulating them and creating a problem. If you want to breed birds, that's a different story. But if you've got pet birds, you don't want a hormonally charged cockatoo or Amazon because they are going to be difficult to manage. We want to keep that bird from becoming sexually uh, on overdrive. Right. I <clears throat> yeah, I 100 percent agree with you. Um, I mean, a lot of people um, getting into birds, they just believe whatever Google says or what Facebook says without doing any type of research on that bird. And, um, you know, that, that's very important, especially if you're just starting off. But my question to you know, was, do you. So, for example, I, I recently I recently had someone contact me. They had cockatiels. And they're experiencing massive problems with gastric yeast. Gastric, ga gastric yeast or megabacteria is inherent in cockatiels. 
So they tried, um, they tried all kinds of things, Epsom salt and da da da. And you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, no, it's not going to stop it. You need to one cut out the fruits because you're feeding the yeast with the sugars and the fruit, and then you're going to get uh, uh, clay, uh, clay that is edible. It's a powdered clay that is sold for canning. And you're going to add some of that to the water because the clay, the kaolin, it's actually kaolin, will reduce the presence of gastric bacteria and save the bird. And then, you know, I said, we're going to put it on a seed diet, on, on a seed diet, because the bird refused to eat pellets. Personally, I've never found a bird that will not eat pellets. Uh, but she said it refused. So, okay, I wasn't going to argue with her, but we put the bird on a seed uh, diet, we switched it over to greens, and we started putting kaolin in the water, and lo and behold, the gastric bacteria uh, came under control. So I'm sorry, I had interrupted you. No problem. Um, my question to you, Tony, was do you have a different diet for your birds outside of breeding season, or is it the same all year round? No, so we vary the diet depending on on, on the species, um, we've got a standard, 70% pellets, 30% vegetables, but we will uh, increase or decrease either one of those to stimulate them. So, for example, if you were a conure breeder and you wanted to stimulate your conures, you would put them, you would remove them off a pelleted diet and you would put them on a seed diet that is low in fat. You don't want a seed diet that's full of sunflower seeds or safflower, or you would put them on a maintenance pelleted diet for six weeks. They get nothing else. At the end of six weeks, you provide them with a nest box. You fill the nest box up with wood, with chunks of wood. We keep the, the old perches, cut them up, and we put them inside the nest. And I'll explain that in a second. And then abruptly, six weeks of dry food abruptly, on the sixth week, we're going to give them 50% vegetables and 50% breeder pellets. Those birds generally go about six to eight weeks later. The reason we're adding wood to the nest is parrots in the wild must prepare their nest. Nobody in nature, nature doesn't provide a nest box full of shavings. The birds must work, must enlarge, and must prepare the nest. By adding chunks of wood, we're duplicating nature. We are focusing the male's attention from just the female to the nest. So in species that are prone to be aggressive, where the males can be very aggressive, we're shifting that aggression away from the net, from the hen to the nest. He's got to prepare the nest because she's not going to pay any attention to him unless there's a nest. And the darkness induces the gonads to swell up. She'll start developing eggs. His testes will swell and he'll start producing sperm. And we uh, we encourage nesting. So it's a multi-pronged pronged approach that gives us the results we want. Okay, and um, another question that falls along the uh, like the way you feed your birds, like uh, is adding vitamins and supplements to the diets necessary? This could go for like breeding season, but also just as somebody who just has birds as a pet. Um, so. You know, if the bird is on a pelleted diet, there is no need, 70% pellets, there's no need for additional vitamin supplementation, except if you're breeding, and then I would recommend adding some additional calcium. Uh, if you are, if you have a seed bird, then yes, I would give a, a vitamin mineral supplement, and I would put it on the food never in the water. Why? In water, vitamins oxidize. After a couple of hours of the bird dunking food in the water, it becomes bacterial soup. Vitamins contain sugars. Sugars feed bacteria, uh, and parrots dunk their food. It's natural. So put the food, put the vitamins and the minerals on their food rather than in the water. And, you know, the old timers 
when I got into aviculture, a standard egg food was fine grated carrot, chopped endive, a great quality whole wheat bread that was toasted and then ground up and hard boiled egg. To that, we would add vitamins, um, wheat germ, calcium, and we would give this to the birds and they would breed. This was obviously pre pellet time uh, and the birds bred very well on it. But we were using the, the soft food, the egg food, as a conduit for the vitamins. Okay. And um, so is there like a best time of day to feed your birds? Like, or is any time of day possible, like, okay to feed your birds? Like, how, what is your method? So we feed, um, we feed vegetables in the morning. We have two bowls in every cage. The birds are on an automatic watering system. So they'll get their vegetables, their chopped vegetables. And then once the, the worker is done, it takes about two hours. And it doesn't take two hours because I've got that many birds, but simply because I want him to interact with my birds. If the bird comes up wanting contact, I want him to spend five minutes interacting with that bird. It deserves it. Uh, and then when they're, when they're done, they come back and then they feed pellets. And the macaws get nuts. And then someplace in the morning, I go around with my little Dave's killer bread um, sandwiches that the birds go crazy for. We want, we want, and people say, oh, you know, tame birds won't breed nonsense. Uh, if the bird is, is adapted, a bird, a tame bird will breed. Um, we have many birds. In fact, we had a visitor today from Chicago and he said palm cockatoos were his favorite bird. I went into a breeding cage and I pulled out the female palm cockatoo and I put her on his shoulder. The male was busy nest building, so he couldn't, you know, I didn't want to disturb him. But our birds are that tame and I want that. I want to be able to have tame birds for several reasons. One, uh, a tame bird will interact with you as the owner or the caretaker. Uh, we are in a tropical storm area. We need those birds to be tame so that we can uh, catch them very quickly if, we're, if there's a storm coming. Right. And we want birds, birds that are tame are gonna stress less. Oh, wow. Even chicks that are parent reared uh, become are mixed with hand reared chicks and then they are allowed to um, to become tame and they'll follow. And because most of the parents are tame, um, when the chicks fledge two, three weeks later, the chicks come right up to the parents to eat my little piece of Dave's killer bread. Um, it's their treat and the chicks soon learn it and uh, they, they stress less. When, when birds are intended for pets, we encourage them to f be flocked. Look, we don't want to produce birds that think they are human attachment. I right. don't want my bird to think it's this. I want my bird to play independently, to understand that it's a bird, to interact with other birds. Many of the birds that show up in rescues are birds that are maladapted, either hormonally charged male cockatoos or amazons. Most of the male, most of the birds in rescues, when it comes to cockatoos, are males. And, um, you know, birds that are maladapted that think they're humans and just never adapt. You could go into my, uh, my nursery and we've got birds that have been weaned for a long time and those birds are brought out. We're in, we're in winter and it does get chilly in Florida. It does drop down to the 60s. So it's a bit too cool for these baby birds. But they go out in an aviary and they interact and we may have African greys and cockatoos or I may have golden conures and Amazons. We don't want to mix cockatoos, for example, with macaws because cockatoos produce powdered downs and some macaws develop allergies. But we can mix macaws with Amazons, macaws with conures. We want these birds to interact. We want birds to know they are birds, that they can play alone. But that they can also play with us. 
Um, this this also follows us to our next question that also relates to this. Um, is there a span of time that the, your birds ha have their food out? Um, and also, how long should a bird have access to its food? Like, is there a time limit or? So, look, most captive parrots are obese. When you look at museum specimens, and museum specimens are birds that museums shot in the wild and then they skin them and they're used for science, for studying. Many of these birds are weighed. When you look at their weight, and you look at the weight of a captive bird, our birds are obese. We know exactly how much our birds will consume. I don't want to go out there in the morning and see food in the bowl. I want the bird to have eaten just about everything we've given it. You know, okay. I want to make sure that the bird has eaten what, um, what it's been given. I don't want my bird to select. You know, I often see, um, in fact, I visited someone the other day to cut their bird's nails. And one macaw had literally three pounds of food. And so what was the bird doing? The bird was picking what it liked and ignoring everything else. What? <laughs> we want the bird to eat. Food. We want the bird to eat what's in its food. So the reason we get vegetables in the morning is the birds have gone all night. They're hungry. They're going to go ahead and eat what's there. And then they can fill up with pellets. And we, we limit the amount. We don't overfeed. Um, we want to make sure that the birds get about 8 to 10% of their body weight in a day. And if, if the bird is not hyperactive, we may reduce that. We've got to remember that wild parrots spend a lot of time foraging. A cage bird, all it's got to do is take two steps, sit in its food bowl and gorge. And we can make food interesting. We can take, for example, um, we can, for rose-breasted cockatoos, we can get a bowl full of pellets and sprinkle some canary seed in there. Have the bird dig for it. We have coconuts, we live in Florida. And, and, you know, I have tons of coconuts. In fact, I bought the properties next to me because they have uh, palm trees so that my birds can have enrichment. We often type, drill holes in the coconut and put food in there. The birds have to dig for it. They may spend all day, but they are occupied. They're doing something that's natural. We want to encourage, we want, we want to make food interesting. It's not just filling up a bowl uh, to overflow and expect the birds to not become obese and to eat a balanced diet. You know, when you get pellets, colored pellets, fruit blend, the birds will pick out a specific color that they like and they'll leave the others. Yep. You know, we don't want that. We want the birds to eat. You know, when I was a kid, um, we were served a bowl full of food. We weren't allowed to get out of the get up from the table until we ate it. And there were many things that I hated. I hated meat when I was a kid. I hated it. I wanted to be a, to be a, a vegetarian. And you know, my father said, "Nope, you've got to eat your steak and your chicken and your fish or whatever, in addition to everything else." And I was not allowed to get up off out of the table until I ate what was what was there. You know, I want my birds to well, they're not going to get punished, but I want to make it where they'll eat everything and make it interesting. Right. You know, you can take you can give vegetables in many forms. Um, you can give them whole hot peppers. You can get an old mattress spring and stick a care a whole carrot in there or a couple of small beets. Let's make it interesting. Let's let's have the bird enjoy what it's doing. Right. And um so earlier we mentioned um something about like uh she a person that you talked to couldn't get their bird to convert to, you know, a, a pelleted diet. Um, so, like, what is your method of converting your birds? I you I know you said you get some birds in that um that you know are from pets so what is your method to convert a bird that's been on an only so, seed diet to so pellets? what you do is you alternate one day you give seeds the next day you give 
pallets. Uh, in the old days, when the quarantine stations got birds in, they were treated with chlorotetracycline for cetacosis. And the birds would come in from the wild. They would be given a bowl full of pellets with some fresh corn on top. Okay. And you know what? None of those birds starved. They ate it. I'm not recommending that you starve your bird, but you can be creative. You can take uh, a dab of peanut butter and roll it around in pellets. Give that to your bird. You can put, uh, pretend you're eating pellets if it's a pet bird. If it's a breeder bird, generally if they can see each other, they pick it up right away. Um, you can add, uh, like I feed natural colored pellets, you can take chopped up beets and mix it in with your pellets. They, they're they attracted to the color red. Um, so there's many things, but generally, you know, I start out with one day pellet, one day seed, one day pellet, one day seed. Um, if you don't want to do that, make little balls of peanut butter or almond butter and give them, uh, uh, wrap them around, you know, roll them around like you're making little uh, meatballs that you're, you're uh, putting bread on. Um, you can take uh, raspberries and in the little opening, you can stick a couple of pellets in there. The pellets will absorb a little bit of the moisture, they stick, and the birds will eat it. There's many things you can do to encourage birds to eat. <clears throat> so, Tony, um, as far as uh, birds' diets and with like the larger birds, like the macaws and the greys, um, those guys require a lot of nuts in their diet, correct? So what we do is it's 70% pellets, 30% vegetables. Um, they get the treats, and then we do give nuts to the macaws and the African greys. The African greys, we use a lot of almonds. Um, they're high in calcium. African greys need calcium. The macaws get all kinds of nuts, and it varies. It, you know, one day they may get macadamia. The next day they may get walnuts or almonds or pecans or whatever. Uh, the only one we will not feed are peanuts. So... Yeah, basically my question was, are like tree nuts essential in a larger parrot's diet or could they still go off of, like like you had mentioned, 30% pellets, um, I mean 70% pellets, 30%, what'd you say, 70%? 70% pellets, 30% vegetables. So yeah. if you were going to breed, I would say nuts are essential. Yes, okay. If you're not going to breed, nuts are not essential, except in a few species, and those species include palm cockatoos. They okay. need, um, sorry, uh, uh, palm cockatoos. Uh, hyacinth macaws, and with cockatoos, it would be palm cockatoos. They need the, the fat in their diet. They don't do real well without them, even and if they're not for breathing. I remember talking to you about it as well in the past. Like I'm st like as of now, I'm still trying to set up a good diet for my Amazons, and I I don't know if you remember or not, but I have my double yellow uh, headed Amazons, and I'm trying to get a good like good diet for breeding season. And I know with the Amazons, they can get fat very easily, right? Very easy. Yeah. So what's up? So with Amazons, for example, what we do here is. Our Amazons begin to breed in February. They're outdoors. In November, they get a good, uh, simple, uh, low-fat maintenance pellet, or they're put on, on a finch mix. Um, and I don't want the finch mix to contain oats because they're fatty. I want it to contain mainly millets. So the, the birds get this we reduce that excess fat that they've accumulated and then we switch them over to the pelleted diet when we have them on maintenance we don't feed uh, uh for those six eight weeks we don't feed them uh, vegetables we don't feed them anything we want them to lose some some excess fat because amazons tend to look at food and they get fat right um and as far as like um, uh, as far as like all your birds go, like, uh, so 
you've been doing this diet for how long? I mean, was this over years or did like you? Um, so it I'm evolved. Sure you I would diet. say that, you know, I've been using pellets since the 1980s. Okay. And um, I went from uh, trying them and then uh, I, I would say earlier, 19. Yeah, early 1980s, and, and I wasn't impressed initially, you know, um, and then eventually uh, they improved, the pellets improved, and I started feeding more. And I would say that past, you know, a couple decades, my birds have been basically on, on a pelleted vegetable diet. And people will say that, uh, oh, you know, I guess like I said, Pellets are not natural. Nothing is really natural. You know, it's all it's all artificial. Uh, you know, what we're feeding our birds is not part of their natural diet. Right. And, um, you know, it's it's really like uh, any time I've had any issues like in aviculture in general, like or whether I have a problem or whatever, I always like go back and watch your videos because like you've had. <laughs> like a ton of experience and, and the experience doesn't lie. You know what I mean? Like you've seen it all, you know, like it's, it's hard to like, and I've seen people talk about the pelleted diets with you, like kind of like almost like arguing with you, but it's like hard to argue with somebody that's been doing this for so well, long. You know, so every I, issue. I recently, uh, you know, a couple, I don't know, a couple months ago, I posted something on pelleted diets and I had a guy tell me though, it's not natural. Uh, we feed a natural diet. And, you know, my question is, okay, how many birds have you bred? And uh, <laughs> what is in your natural diet? And, you know, I said, okay, so uh, maybe maybe I've been stupid all along, you know, and I haven't seen broccoli going growing on trees in the Amazon or, <laughs> you know, kale uh, growing on, on palm trees as a, as, a, as a succulent. I mean, nothing that they're feeding is natural. They can't tell me that my diet is not natural. And then they say, well, it's terrible. And there's all this documented research. I'm very open-minded. If there is research right. that shows uh, pellets are bad, please provide it, but also provide something that says, chop is the last Coke in the desert. It is the <laughs> ultimate, you know, uh, yeah. diet. If we're gonna look at science, let's look at science. And then how many birds Whoever convinced you to use this diet, how many birds have they bred? You can, you know, you can come into my aviary at any given time. You can visit my nursery. When you've bred multiple generations of a species, that speaks louder than someone that has one bird that listened to uh, to somebody and changed their diet. Right. And, um, and, and I want to say, like, say, you like, are a... You're a world traveler, aren't you? You've been to like some of these like places and actually, yeah. You know, I've seen most of the parrots in the wild. wild. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, it's difficult. I don't like to argue and I don't like to block people. I believe I am a firm believer in freedom of speech. Oh yeah, of course. Um, Where I have a problem is where somebody has one or two birds and they're experts. Oh, well, the bird was plucking on a pelleted diet and it's now on a chopped diet. Well, when a bird plucks, changes often stop plucking. The first thing that I do when somebody says, I've got a plucking parrot, I move it. Move it from one room to the other. Create change. And I have just as many birds in my aviary that came from an, a chopped natural diet that plucked, that stopped plucking when they were on pellets. So, wow. wow. You know, and then they say, oh, well, wheat, you know, wheat is not normal and, and you know, corn is terrible. Uh, you know, would you like to go with me to the Archive of Indies in Seville and look at what early discoverers long before the Internet, long before people were breeding parrots in captivity, what, what they were finding and what they were reporting? And, uh, you know, parrots are tenacious. They're highly, they're, they're, they're hard. Uh, if they're on a good diet, on a bad diet, they don't survive. And there's lots and lots and lots of documents of this. When you look at the history of London Zoo during the early days, you know, the average lifespan of most of these birds was a couple of years and then they died. 
Right. Well, and um, right. No, go ahead, Sean. Um, if you don't mind me asking, Tony, you said you had mentioned that pellets are seventy percent of your bird's diet. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what pellet brand do you use for your birds? And you said you for breeding for breeder pairs, you use specifically breeders pellets, correct? Right. So there's maintenance and then there's breeder pellets. Maintenance pellets usually have lower protein and lower fat. Breeder pellets have higher fat and higher uh, protein. Uh, the pellets that I use are manufactured in Europe. You know, my personal decision is I, I like to one use organic where possible and I like to use non-GMO. That's my personal choice. I'm not basing that on any uh, on science when it comes to birds. I'm, I'm, I'm basing that on what I can you know, I like to eat organic and I don't like GMO. It just, it's me. So I get my pellets brought in from Europe, but you know, there's lots of great brands out there. I always recommend that you get something that's locally available, that has a track record. Anybody can contrive a, a pellet, anybody. Let's look at a pellet and, it, you know, oh, I won't use this because it's got peanuts or I won't use that because it's um, ground up peanuts in the pellet or because it's got corn or it's got wheat or it's got soy. Um, you know, base it on something that is multi-ingredient and start with, a, with the, the principle that, listen, none of these things that we're feeding the birds occur in the wild. They're not part of their natural diet. <coughs> You know, I don't see any any pellet manufacturer anywhere in the world making uh, pellets out of Sierra palm, tetragastrus fruit, and on and on. And, you know, there's parrots in the wild eat hundreds of foods. I don't see any of this in the, in those formulations. Right. And, uh, as for your, because, uh, um, like, as, as for the Amazons, we had mentioned that they get fat very easily. Do you um, uh, recommend using the maintenance pellets, or do you recommend using the... I would recommend outside the breeding season maintenance pellets. If they still have not lost enough weight to come uh, as you approach the breeding season, I would put them on a finch seed mix. Okay. And nothing else. And you certainly don't want to feed an obese parrot fruits. The sugar is only you know, accumulate body fat. Okay, and uh, one last question for you before we go. We like to ask this on every podcast just because, like, it really helps everybody. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to a new aviculturist, what would it be? Um, learn to walk before you can run. Uh, budgies make fantastic pets. Cockatiels are wonderful pets. You don't have to start aviculture by buying a scarlet macaw. Um, walk slowly, get started, interact with birds, make sure that they're for you. Understand that, a, that acquiring a bird is like adopting a five-year-old child. Yep. The difference is this feathered child will not go to college, will not become independent, will rely on you, will throw perpetual temper tantrums, will be noisy, will periodically bite you, and on and on and on. Understand what you're getting into. And if you are committed, parrots make incredible pets. Yep. yep. It's just like owning a dog. I mean, they, they make great companions. Yeah. Just understand what you're getting into. And you don't have to go into a giant bird cockatiels you know up until two years ago i had cockatiels because i liked them and people would say why do you have cockatiels when you've got palm cockatoos because this isn't about about rarity this is about liking them and cockatiels are incredible pets budgies are incredible pets a tame budgie that talks it's a hoot it is a great bird. So, you know, start out small. Understand the commitment. And then you can always go further. Thank you so much, Tony, for right. coming on our podcast. We really thank you. It. Um, 
in this span of almost an hour of having you on here, you've not only educated our audience, but you've personally educated us on multiple different fields. Are, are, we only spoke about diet on birds. If we was to talk about birds in general, breeding, keeping, it'll take hours and hours. Yeah. But just this little part <laughs> on diets, you've just educated myself personally so much on it. And we would and love then, to have you on in the future. If you're ever free in the future, we'd love to have you on again. Like, thank you. We'll come back. You know, and remember, look, there's more than one way to skin a cow. You know, right. try different things. Birds are individualistic. Uh, understand that. You know, I, I am, I have a ritual that I get up and nobody can talk to me until I have a cup of coffee because I'm incoherent. <laughs> You know, some of these birds don't want to be bothered early in the morning. They want to be left alone. Let me wake up. Then you can play with me. Understand that they're individuals and that some of them have their unique behaviors. Right. And um, all right. Well, that's going to be it for today. Again, thank you, Tony. And uh, we'll see you guys. Have a great week. one. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.